to part two of the screencast. This is Ms. Longley. We're going to be looking at the four major plant groups. We talked about in screencast one that plants have evolved from their aquatic ancestors, green algae. So what we're going to do next is look at these four major plant groups and see how they have adapted to life on land. And we're gonna start with the first group, which is most closely related to its ancestor green algae. So here we go. The first group is the bryophytes. So the bryophytes is a non-vascular plant. That means that they do not have roots, stems, or leaves. They use osmosis to absorb water, so kind of like a sponge, and they use diffusion to transport nutrients into their cells. Reproduction. So a quick note about plant reproduction. It's very weird and it's different from humans. Humans can only produce sperm or egg cells to make the next generation, but plants can produce both spores and sperm or egg. So a spore is kind of like a gamete, but it does not have to be fertilized. It just needs to germinate and grow into a new plant. So with bryophytes, we're going to use moss as an example. Here in this picture you can see moss and then you can see these tall stalks rising above. These contain spores which then will release and they give rise to the next generation which is sperm or egg. So the sperm that's released have flagella and they're very dependent on water in order to swim and fertilize a bryophyte egg. So if they are not successful, then the next generation doesn't happen. So bryophytes are very dependent on water, and it's because their sperm needs to be able to swim and fertilize an egg to lead to the next generation of bryophytes. Where you're going to find bryophytes is in very wet and warm environments like shady forest floors. They are really short in size, so they typically will not reach more than like a height of 10 centimeters. So they're very, very small and short, and that's because they are non-vascular plants. And again, these are the most closely related to the green algae ancestors. Let's take a look at group two. So ferns is our second group. They're a little bit more evolved than the bryophytes. They are vascular plants, and that's because they actually do have true leaves called fronds, as you can see in this picture here. And they reproduce in a very similar way to the bryophytes. They are still dependent on water, but here's how they reproduce. So if you're to flip a fern's frond, to the underside, you'll see these teeny little reddish dots. These are the spores, so they release and they give rise to the next generation, which is either sperm or egg. That sperm, again, needs water in order to swim and fertilize the egg. Once that egg is fertilized, it gives rise to the next generation, and eventually we get baby ferns. So these are called fiddleheads because as they uh, emerge from the ground, they kind of unroll like a fruit roll up. So very cute. Ferns you're typically going to find also in very wet environments. Um, so this can be like shady forests, bogs, swamps, rocky crevices, and most oftentimes we think of ferns as being in the tropics. So this is the second plant group. It's similar to the bryophytes in that they are still dependent on water in order to reproduce, but they are vascular plants, so they do have leaves. Next, we have the gymnosperms. So this plant group is even less dependent on water, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So they are vascular plants. They have leaves, which most gymnosperms have leaves that are needle-like, like in this picture here. 
And that's just an adaptation to dryness so that they do not have to worry about receiving enough water. It allows them to retain that moisture inside the plant. They also have stems and they have roots. Reproduction. Remember, plants are weird. Gymnosperms use pollen instead of spores. They're a little bit more adapted. So pollen is actually sperm. So we're going to talk about how gymnosperms reproduce. They are dependent on air. Notice it's not water this time, it's air. So for gymnosperms to reproduce, they rely on air to help them disperse pollen, which actually comes from male pine cones, as you can see here. So they kind of look like fuzzy little yellow, uh, almost miniature corn on the cob kind of things. Uh, so they release pollen. The air transports it, hopefully to a different gymnosperm uh, plant. So it's not the same parent plant because we want genetic diversity. And that pollen fertilizes the female pine cone, which is the ones that you typically recognize all the time. So the female pine cone, once it is fertilized, each of these scales is actually a seed. So the pine cone falls off the tree, the seeds hopefully become buried in the ground, and then that will allow them to germinate and give rise to the next generation of gymnosperms. Environment. So gymnosperms, are typically going to be found in dry and cooler forests. So this is oftentimes why when you think of like in the um, tundra or taiga, you're typically going to find some conifers and that's because they do very well in dry and cool environments. They're nicknamed the evergreens because they retain their green color and that's because they can photosynthesize year round. It slows a little bit down in the winter time, but that's why they have that green color. One last thing about gymnosperms is there are some gymnosperms that don't typically fit the description of like a conifer. Um, and that's like the ginkgo trees. They don't look like a gymnosperm, but they do have the same characteristics. These are the really brightly yellow color um, trees that you see in the fall. And then there's also the cycads too. So that is the gymnosperms. Let's take a look at the very last plant group. So here we have angiosperms. Angiosperms are the most evolved and they're the best adapted to life on land. So they are vascular plants. There's so much diversity in these plants. They have leaves, they have root systems, they have stems. Um, there's too many differences to name, um, but just know that there's so much diversity in this plant group. Angiosperms also use pollen to reproduce. Uh, like gymnosperms, they are dependent on air to help disperse pollen and sometimes seeds, but they also can rely on pollinators to help disperse pollen and seeds as well. So in this picture here, you can see this bird, it's eating a berry, which is actually a fruit, and inside that fruit is the seed. So this would be an example of an animal that helps with the dispersal of the seeds. I wanted to talk a little bit about a different kind of angiosperm plant that doesn't necessarily rely on animals to disperse its seeds, it actually relies on air. So that is the dandelion. So here in this image, you're gonna see a dandelion and it starts off being this brightly yellow color that's to attract pollinators. And once the pollen fertilizes the egg, then those seeds, are attached to these white feathery tough stalks and eventually that stalk gets picked up by the wind and it carries the seed to a farther location than the parent plant. So this is just an example of how air can help disperse the seeds as well. It doesn't always have to be an animal. 
And last, angiosperms, because of their wide diversity in structures, they can also be found in a majority of the habitats. So angiosperms actually account for 80% of all living plants that you see today. Um, in this picture here, you can see just like the different kinds. Um, sometimes we often think about the fruit only, but that also comes from a plant. So like avocados and peas come from plants. Um, sometimes we only focus on the flower part. That's also part of a plant. And then a lot of times grasses are also angiosperms as well. So kind of recapping these four major groups, remember that they all evolved from the ancestor green algae over time, accumulating all these adaptations. This has allowed them to thrive on land. So that is the end of our screencast. I hope you learned something and thanks for watching. Bye.